American women, including women in Minnesota, were organizing and fighting for the ballot, or the right to vote. Many women were upset that the 15th Amendment gave African Americans the right to vote, but excluded women. Suffragists began exercising their free speech and protest rights, conducting the first formal picket of the White House ever. These suffragists felt a responsibility to maintain their role as women while also wielding more electoral power in shaping their nation's government. Gaining the right to vote was the most certain way to continue expanding rights for women throughout the United States. Throughout the 1800s, women in Minnesota, the United States, and parts of Europe were viewed as second-class citizens and practically treated like property. Women were responsible for the household and children, very little more. Some women made bold stands for expanding women's rights, but most women quietly disagreed with the system that wasn't fair. Attempts to coordinate a push for rights remained small and disorganized until the first Women's Rights Convention in Seneca Falls, New York. Seneca Falls Women's Convention in 1848 was the first time that women, or a woman, stood up in a public forum and said women should have the right to vote. And that was Elizabeth Cady Stanton. And that was not an opinion that they had really wanted to have brought out at that convention. They were afraid it was too early. And they didn't really think that that was an appropriate thing for her to be lobbying for that early already. The convention produced a list of demands for women's equality and excited its participants to return home and push for women's suffrage like never before. The women's suffrage movement was also closely tied with other major social movements of the time, including the abolitionist movement and the temperance movement. As the nation spread westward, a few western states permitted women the right to vote in local elections. Wyoming Territory was the first state to allow women to vote in 1869. They did this to attract more women to the area. Later on, Utah, Colorado, and Idaho gave women limited suffrage. These early examples of women voting became the proving grounds that women could still be seen by men as feminine, but also exercising the right to vote. Women wanted more than just the right to vote. They wanted freedom to make their own decisions. Some women believed that the right to vote was needed for women to have additional freedoms. Others felt that women should push for their rights on multiple fronts. One of those fronts, at the time, was just reform. Because men were the ones that had the right to vote, gay men to understand limited rights that women dealt with was the key to securing suffrage. One of the ways women, including Frances E. Russell of St. Paul, did this was with the dress reform and movement and dress reform parties. A dress reform party often was when you would invite a group of people over, and you're, this is kind of like a political caucus or a political statement. You'd invite a group of people over, and then you'd get a man, and you'd put a hoop skirt on him and tell him that he was to carry a baby up the stairs and to simulate a baby to give him an armful of, of towels or clothes or something to carry up the stairs, just to prove that the way women were dressing and the big hoop skirts and then later on the bustles and all those kinds of things really wasn't very practical. Um, it was hard to do any housework, it was hard to take care of a baby, it was hard to walk up the stairs and in the argument of the women who were for having dress reform, this was part of women's rights that women were being held back because of even their clothing. Seneca Falls inspired numerous women's organizations throughout the nation, and Minnesota was part of this movement from the very beginning. The early suffrage movements in Minnesota were not well organized. The early suffragists used local petitions to attempt to get support for the suffrage movement. In the last quarter of the 1800s, Minnesota women started their own branch of the National Women's Party, a group called the Minnesota Political Equality Club and the Minnesota Women's Suffrage Association, the MWSA. The MWSA was formed in 1881 by 14 women including Harriet Bishop, Sarah Stearns, and Julia B. Nelson. Sarah Stearns was the first president of the MWSA and went on to establish the Duluth Women's Suffrage Circle. From the start of the suffrage movement to the end, women evolved to have excellent leadership and political skills. One of these women was Clara Hampson Newland, a Minnesota suffragist. While raising her seven children, Newland found time to lead the Minnesota fight for suffrage as the last president of the MWSA. Once women won the right to vote, Newland became the first president of the League of Women Voters. Newland gave many speeches throughout Minnesota, 
and she organized other suffragists in the state, as well as in South Dakota and Iowa. Yulin believed that if the nearby states gave women the right to vote, Minnesota would feel that they should as well. 1916 was a very busy year for Clara. In May, she took on the responsibility of organizing and presiding over the Mississippi Valley Conference of Suffragists in Minneapolis, Minnesota. This conference was known to be similar to national conventions in attendance and activities. Claire was introduced at this convention as the Moses who was leading Minnesota to the Promised Land. Claire also attended the Republican Convention in Chicago, Illinois in June and joined over 10,000 suffragists who marched in the wind and rain. The Republicans failed to add suffrage to their platform. Two weeks later, in St. Louis, Missouri, 5,000 women, including Clara herself, lined the streets so that the Democrats couldn't get from their hotels to the Democratic Convention. Amazingly enough, all the women were completely silent from their yellow sashes, hats, and umbrellas as they soon formed a silent line called the Golden Line that was 12 blocks long. Clara also gave speeches to the Democrats on an improvised bandstand. Since she is suffrage, to say we are more influential without the vote is not sensible or true. We have no fear of the foreign born voter as have the anti-suffragists. Most of the immigrants to Minnesota come from the Scandinavian countries where women already have the ballot. And moreover, we know them well and that they are not unfit to cast the ballot. Voting is an expression of opinion, and women have opinions. She took part in many protests and rallies, but preferred to help through the government. She resigned her presidency of the League of Women Voters within her first year because she preferred to help through things such as government campaigns and conventions. Another suffragist who continually fought for suffrage was Dr. Flora Aldrich, a local to Anoka County. Dr. Flora Aldrich was a uh, very advanced lady for her time. She believed very wholeheartedly in enfranchisement, the right to vote. She thought that would make her um, more educated and a better companion for a husband. And she just really thought that was something that was very important. So she worked for it. She did a lot of speeches and a lot of talking to people uh, in women's club organizations and things to try to get people to lean on their husbands to get them to vote for suffrage. Because remember, the women didn't get to vote for their own suffrage. They had to get the men to vote for the suffrage. Suffragists eventually prevailed in 1919 when Congress passed the 19th Amendment that June and sent it to the states for ratification. The amendment said that women could vote in national elections just the same as men, so they could vote in all elections. The fight that had begun at Seneca Falls 71 years earlier was entering the decisive final round. Minnesota was the 15th state to ratify the amendment on September 8, 1919. And almost a year later, Tennessee became the 36th state to ratify the amendment, making it officially the law of the land. Passage of the 19th Amendment was a victory for women across the United States. As Clara Ewan said after the ratification of the amendment, today is the commencement, rather than the end, of our work. The League of Women Voters was formed to encourage women to vote and teach them the value of voting. Even though women had fought a hard battle for the right to vote, women did not immediately exercise the right in the numbers expected. In modern times, beginning in the late 1980s and continuing to the most recent national election in 2012, women are voting at higher rates than men. The work of American women, including women from Minnesota who felt a responsibility to wield more electoral power, greatly expanded voting rights in the United States. Women who organized and fought for the right to vote were successful with the ratification of the 19th Amendment in 1920. Along the way, these women used those newfound rights to guarantee their constitutional rights to own property, to possess their wages and earnings, to make contracts, bring lawsuits, and have equal guardianship of children. Women's suffrage matters because it allowed women to begin to have an influence in the government's decisions. It is important to understand because without the freedoms that come from being a voter, women of today would not live in a world where they can do and be whatever they want to be.